Right. Welcome, everybody. So for today, um, we're trying something slightly different. I've invited Moham Arab um, to give a guest lecture. So I met Moham earlier this year at a seminar where we talked about software engineering and AI and kind of how to build better systems um, with a bunch of interesting discussions, some of which influenced what we talked about earlier this, uh, in, in a couple of lectures. Um, but he also at the seminar, he gave a talk um, about yeah, building machine learning systems in production. He has founded quite a few companies actually doing that. Um, he's currently the CEO of Relational AI, and he can probably tell you a little bit about what they're doing. They're hiring, I assume, they're hiring great people. They have an amazing team. Uh, but also in general, so he has been working on neural networks using this in production in business systems in the 90s already. Um, the, the credit card fraud detection and all kinds of other things. Um, and the talk that he gave, and I think this is also what you're seeing today, is uh, really about struggling uh, with large amounts of diverse data in businesses. Um, right? So this is something that fits the current lecture quite well. We talked about data quality on Tuesday, and um, he's going to use about half the lecture today, and then I want to continue talking a little bit about big data systems and data processing. We want to go a little bit further in that direction. Um, so please welcome Moham and also ask questions, uh, raise your hand right in the chat. Um, this is supposed to be interactive and um, have fun. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Christian. Uh, good to see you again. It was uh, our trip to Dogstool was the last trip I took. Anyways, I came back from Germany. I was immediately grounded. Uh, yeah. Same uh, for me. Yeah. So nice to see you again, uh, this time uh, over Zoom. Uh, and you're right, the, the presentation I'm going to give today is basically the same presentation that I gave at uh, Darkstool uh, and maybe added a couple of slides just to highlight some points that um, I think will be interesting uh, to the class here. Uh, okay, let's get started. So well, my context here is, uh, the context of this talk is this is about uh, software engineering for machine learning and for AI, not the other way around, although the other way around is also very interesting. Uh, this is also a talk that uh, I call it sort of as uh, based on my experience with real businesses uh, that are not uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, or Google, or Microsoft. I consider um, uh, Google and Amazon and Apple and so on as dealing with machine learning and AI at a totally different scale, but also dealing with it uh, with resources that most businesses, or most or, uh, typical businesses don't have. Okay, uh, if you go into a typical bank or retailer or uh, airline company or, uh, you know, other steps sort of more standard businesses, uh, you just don't have the resources and the expertise that uh, a Google or Apple will have. Uh, and then the third uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, level of context setting I want to make here is that uh, this is about building machine learning and AI systems uh, for enterprises, for enterprise decision making. This is not about uh, Consumer-oriented AI. This is not about you know helping you recognize uh, your friends in uh, in your uh, pictures on your iPhone or whatever. Uh, and so there, are the sources of the data that that, that has implications, uh, of course, on the kind of data that you uh, work with and uh, the kind of data that you have to process when you build uh, machine learning models. Okay. Um, my experience is grounded over uh, 30 years almost, uh, starting uh, going back to a company called HNC Software. In fact, before working at HNC, I worked uh, for AT&T for two years uh, on computer vision systems. Uh, but uh, AT&T is a big company. Uh, HNC uh, and, and, and it does many things. HNC was a company created uh, specifically to build um, machine learning, what we today we would call machine learning systems. Uh, uh, that, uh, that solve real world problems for our customers. The main solution that HNC offered was around fr uh, credit card fraud detection. And uh, I started working there in 1993. And by 1995, 1996, uh, we went public. And when we went public, we had already, uh, we had 23 of the top 25 credit card issuing banks as our customers in the US. Um, and something like 87 of the top 100 in the world uh, were using our credit card fraud detection software. 
at the time, the technology of choice was, uh, believe it or not, neural networks. But these were not deep models. These are one layer models. Um, in the late 80s, people discovered that if you add a, a hidden layer into a neural network, you can start doing nonlinear mappings uh, from input to output. And the neural network uh, is theoretically now a universal approximator. And uh, there was a resurgence of interest in neural network, uh, neural networks. And, uh, but of course, we didn't have all the GPUs and the computational power that we have today. So we could only afford to learn you know, a one hidden layer neural networks. And so we used neural networks with uh, proprietary hardware accelerators, along with rule-based systems and uh, with um, linear programming, injury programming type systems uh, to build these applications. Uh, the terminology at the time was not machine learning or it was computational intelligence or data mining or database mining. In fact, HNC owned the trademark on the, on the term database mining. And uh, that's why a lot of people ended up calling the, the field data mining. Uh, HNC went public in 1995 and was acquired by uh, FICO for uh, something like $750 million uh, in 2002. And the HNC footprint is a big part of FICO or Fair Isaac and a lot uh, underpins a lot of what happens in, uh, in sort of the consumer credit rating uh, uh, and consumer oriented fraud detection and, and so on. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, in those, in the applications that we uh, developed there, you have to make a prediction about whether a particular transaction was fraudulent or not. And uh, if it was, uh, and then of course you have to live with the consequence of that decision, either being uh, correct or being a false positive or being false uh, negative. And uh, depending on what it ended up being, you, could, you have to deal with different impacts on the business. So for example, if you decline a transaction uh, that turned out being fraudulent, then you save the recovery costs of the fraud. But if you decline a transaction and end up being a legitimate transaction, uh, you have an unsatisfied customer. Uh, or if you accept a, a, a transaction that was fraudulent, then you incur recovery cost again, and, uh, uh, or you incur it here, or you save it here. And if you accept it and it was legitimate, then you have a satisfied customer, okay? So you have to you know, worry about uh, the various scenarios here and uh, different banks needed different, to be able to set different policies uh, that were consistent with their uh, customer, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the way they want to deal with their customers. So maybe if you were a very important customer, they would let more suspicious transactions through because they didn't want to risk upsetting you with a, with a, decl a decline. Uh, but if you are a less profitable customer, they would uh, be more stringent in terms of what uh, transactions they accept and what they don't. Okay, uh, in 1996, HNC bought a company called Retech. At the time we bought Retech, it was less than 20 people, less than $10 million in revenue. And Retech was building ERP solutions uh, for retailers. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, Retech agreed to be acquired by us was because they thought that uh, predictive analytics and machine learning and AI and, uh, and all that good stuff uh, would be hugely differentiating capability uh, in their footprint and the application footprint for retailers. And uh, that included applications that were like demand forecasting, which is all about trying to predict what the demand is gonna be for a product that a retailer is carrying, uh, supply chain optimization, uh, uh, which is, um, you can think of a sort of a decision problem around how to optimize the flow of inventory through the supply chain. Uh, and pricing and many, many other applications in the retail context. Uh, and within a few years of uh, buying uh, Retech, Retech had become uh, the dominant solution provider into the retail industry with a majority of the retail global 250 uh, uh, clients. So it includes Walmart, and includes Kroger, and includes uh, uh, you know, every, uh, many, many retailers that you would recognize. The techniques we use there to do this kind of work were based on time series uh, technology and uh, automa automating time series, multi-level time series, uh, uh, because retail data is often very sparse because for a particular product in a particular store doesn't sell every day uh, for many products. Uh, we used uh, reg traditional uh, regression techniques and uh, we used uh, uh, optimization technology that was, um, you know, uh, heuristic uh, based along, to go along with some of the, the work that we were, uh, the technology we were using to do linear programming and interior programming. Uh, Retech became very valuable. And in uh, the November of 1999, it was spun out of HMC in a separate IPO. 
uh, and for a, uh, for about a couple of hours in the March of 2000, Retech was worth more than the top six airlines, U.S. airlines combined, because it was the height of the bubble. Uh, eventually, uh, valuations calmed down, and Retech was acquired by Oracle uh, for about 640 or 650 million dollars in uh, 2005. Okay, so a lot of value created. Uh, uh, with, by uh, leveraging uh, machine learning and uh, doing something that most people are not aware uh, uh, is, is being done because it's in a kind of enterprise context as opposed to a consumer context. Okay, and as uh, you might have seen anecdotes like this before, uh, uh, you know, about uh, beer and diapers going together in the retail context because, you know, dad gets sent out to buy some diapers and, uh, uh, the, they put the beer by the diapers so that, uh, you know, dad can pick up a six pack of beer or whatever. I'm not sure whether that anecdote is true or not. We, we never saw that in the data we looked at, but we did see interesting things like uh, in certain, uh, you know, Walgreens uh, stores, you would find uh, people buying, you know, tin foil and lighters. Uh, and the speculation there is that they, uh, they were using that uh, as drug paraphernalia for example, uh, and, and things like that. So that was, I can, I can confirm that that, that pairing uh, does exist in the, in the real world. And of course, the supply chain is a very you know, involved uh, system uh, involving stores and warehouses and factories and consumers and retailers and wholesalers and manufacturers and so on and orchestrating uh, the flow of inventory uh, in a way that uh, is efficient and robust uh, is a non-trivial uh, task for uh, machine learning and AI, uh, but in the in the 90s when this was going on, this was all sort of um, put under the uh, the label of operations research and uh, forecasting. Uh, but today, people doing it today would sort of claim that they were using machine learning and AI to do that. Next company I'm uh, I'm involved in here. I'll try to pick this up a little bit. Is a company called Brickstream, uh, which did uh, in-store video analytics. Uh, using uh, old school computer vision. This is uh, pre uh, deep learning. Uh, ultimately, this company was acquired by a company called Point Gray, which was acquired by a company called Fleur in 2015. Uh, basically, you put stereo cameras in the ceilings of stores. This is a, uh, a, a large format store here where the entrance is down here, I believe, somewhere, and consumers go in and they walk around the store, and everywhere you see uh, a lighter color or a red uh, or yellow color that means it's that part of the store sees more traffic and everywhere you see a cooler color like a blue color or a black color that means there's not a ton of uh, uh, traffic there and so what ultimately you're trying to measure here is the number of uh, eyeballs that see a particular product uh, in a store and kind of correlation of demand for that product based on where it is so you can imagine a product placed back here doesn't see as much traffic and therefore is less likely to sell than a product say placed uh, you know, here uh, next to the cash registers on an end cap. Okay, uh, and, and this, this heat map here is really a probability distribution of traffic in a store. And so if you studied generative models and those kinds of models in the context of the, uh, this class, you can sort of see how data can be collected and can be sort of uh, used to represent a probability distribution. Then you can then use uh, uh, in, as input to downstream uh, machine learning systems uh, machine learning based systems that will then use this information to predict demand for a particular product based on where it is in the store. Okay, and then the next company, uh, so Brickstream I was involved in, in helping start, uh, the first two I was not, I was just hired into them. The next company was a, a company that did wireless network optimization. We had customers like AT&T and Singular at the time and America Mobile and Telefonica. The techniques we used there were uh, Monte Carlo simulation based and heuristic uh, search. We did uh, we used simulated, simulated annealing in particular to optimize the frequency allocation to various uh, radios in a wireless network. This company was acquired by Ericsson in 2010 uh, for about $100 million. And, and again, uh, the idea here is that you have these, uh, these cellular towers uh, or these radios spread out in a, in a, in a physical environment and you wanted to optimize uh, the allocation of, uh, of frequency and the allocation of equipment to each of these uh, 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 points. And you wanted to uh, configure the equipment so that it's pointed in the right direction in the right way uh, to maximize uh, capacity and to minimize drop calls and bit error rate and all that kind of stuff. 
Okay. And then finally, uh, the most recent company I have start, uh, was sold uh, to Infor in 2016, was again coming back into retail and working on demand forecasting, supply chain optimization, and assortment planning, and so on, but doing it entirely on the cloud and, you, and doing it with more modern uh, machine learning uh, technology, like leveraging uh, factorization machines and, and other machine learning techniques. Okay, so hopefully uh, I, that, that 15 minutes I just gave you there uh, helps you understand that I've got uh, some experience I can draw on when, when I talk to you about uh, uh, the software uh, engineering for ML or for AI problem. Okay, so um, one common thing that you learn from doing this in the, in, in the, you know, over the years is that businesses are really big systems. They can think of them as complex systems, no different than biological or physical systems that have a lot of uh, complexity, variability, and detail. And then in order to manage the complexity of the business, we have to build simplifying models. And uh, you might have learned from other software engineering classes about people, for example, building financial models and spreadsheets uh, and making a lot of decisions uh, based on what the financial models are, uh, you know, are predicting about the impact of a decision uh, on the business. Okay, in the end, businesses have to worry about profitability and making money. Of course, there are other types of models. There are data models that would go into a database that capture elements of the business. There's supply chain network models that ultimately map to linear programming, integer programming uh, systems. There are statistical consumer demand models that predict uh, you know, what, how many cans of Coke you would sell if you uh, put them in a certain place in the store or if you price them in a certain way. There are price elasticity models that tell you, you know, which products are elastic or not or sensitive to price changes. Uh, and then of course there are process models that you might use to uh, run the business, okay? Uh, if you work in enterprise, you'll, you'll pick up right away that these models are, there are many of them, they're inconsistent with each other, and they get to map to either spreadsheeting technology typically, and, and any reasonably sized business will have thousands, tens of thousands of these little spreadsheets being used by people all over the place uh, with uh, you know, all sorts of bugs that you get when people are rolling their own uh, spreadsheets. Uh, uh, you got that uh, where you have, um, you know, detail, but you don't see the, uh, 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 the big picture. Or you have uh, uh, enterprise systems that are systems like SAP or Oracle, where again, you have lots and lots of detail around every product or every customer or every store and so on, but you kind of lose the forest. You can't see the forest for the trees, okay? And, and the enterprise systems are so rigid and unwieldy uh, it creates the opportunity for people to roll their own models, basically, in spreadsheets. Now, ideally, you would want to have something that has the agility and the uh, flexibility of spreadsheet, but uh, built on top of the, infra the kind of infrastructure that's robust and, and uh, uh, you know, industrial grade, uh, like enterprise systems. And that combination doesn't really exist, okay? Because ideally, you want these, these models to be built and maintained by domain experts who can improve them over time. But if you build them on this enterprise stack, you have to deal with a complexity that's uh, overwhelming. And I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so this is an example of a model I found on, uh, on the internet. It's a DuPont uh, return on investment model. So every decision that DuPont makes allegedly is processed this way. You look at, you know, if I spend a uh, million dollars on something, what kind of return am I gonna get on that investment? And that return on investment is a function of turnover multiplied by earnings as a percentage of sales and earnings is uh, uh, computed as sales minus the cost of sales and the cost of sales has these components and so on. Now, no two businesses are alike. And so as you start getting into the details of a specific business, the, the detail out here uh, starts to change dramatically. So for example, a, a software business, the cost of a software business is uh, labor and compute. It's basically what salaries you pay and what you, what you pay Amazon or or Google uh, for cloud computing, that drives the, the bulk of your costs. Whereas uh, in a retailer, uh, their costs come from labor, but also from the inventory that they're buying and putting on the shelves, as well as the real estate that they're renting or, or also acquiring uh, that uh, takes up uh, you know, their capital and, and, and so on. And so you know, if, you're, if you're modeling a retail business, you would have a model that looks very different in detail than uh, the, the, the software business even though at the headline level, profitability is sales minus costs. Okay, and then, you know, for retailers, you can dig in, I'm in the interest of time, I won't read this uh, slide to you, but there are different ways of breaking down sales as a function of units sold times unit selling price, 
um, you know, minus lost sales, et cetera, et cetera. And then the costs are procurement costs and transportation costs and distribution costs and, and warehouse handling costs and capital costs and all sorts of costs. And then, of course, you have constraints that must be satisfied by these models because, you, you know, you have to deal with the laws of physics. You can't get a product from point A to point B without spending some, uh, some time. Uh, uh, and, of course, you have regulatory and legal constraints that might say, for example, an employee can't work more than 40 hours without, uh, you know, getting paid overtime uh, if they're not a salaried employee, an hourly employee. Okay, so uh, there are all these constraints that you have to factor in, but ideally uh, you want to, you know, to think of your business as modeled as a set of equations uh, and, and not have to deal with the complexity of the underlying technology that's driving that, okay? And the, the set of equations can include statistical models, machine learning models that predict something about how the world will work if you uh, uh, make a certain decision. Okay, now this slide comes from a former customer of mine. This is actually 2% of their IT footprint. Uh, and it represents the, uh, the systems that ultimately end up implementing the kinds of models we're talking about. Okay, so models that, you know, if you write them by hand would be, you know, a dozen pages or 50 pages of, of uh, you know, rules or, or equations uh, have to be mapped to systems that uh, are a mess. And so each box here uh, is a, is a uh, represents actually a set of technologies, like this box here in the middle is the box that where my former company, Retech, uh, developed uh, things. And, uh, and, and if you look underneath the covers, that box uh, has many, many different technology components. It has a transactional database, which is programmed in SQL and maybe PL SQL and, and uh, uh, Pro-C, which is a batch programming language. It has an application server, which expresses business logic in Java and, and or C Sharp or whatever. It has a UI component, which is implemented in browser using JavaScript and HTML. Uh, and that layer here would capture the uh, OLTP layer, the bookkeeping layer, the what's going on in my business now layer. Of course, businesses want to be able to do analytics. So they typically have a uh, business intelligence layer that involves a, data, a database for data warehousing, like uh, Teradata. In the 90s, it would have been Teradata or Netiza. Uh, a, a BI app server that would be, in the 90s would have been a microstrategy with business objects and then of course another user interface. And, uh, and then it would have a forward looking planning layer because the BI layer is read only. And there you would have technologies like RPAS or Hyperion or TM1 and a front end that could be Excel. And of course you would have to glue all this stuff together with ETL technologies and so on. And if you wanna do something predictive, uh, you would need to build a model. Again, in the 80s and 90s, it would have been MATLAB or SPSS or R. Uh, and if you wanted to build a prescriptive model, an optimization model, you would use languages like OPL or AMP or GAMS and solvers like CPLEX uh, or Dash or CoinOR. Okay, that's uh, easily a dozen different programming languages, three or four different data management systems, uh, a, a bunch of competing uh, programming paradigms uh, that you can categorize as being either declarative, like SQL is declarative or Excel is declarative, where you just basically say what you want and the system figures out how to compute it, or imperative, and if it's imperative, it's either object-oriented or procedural, or uh, in some cases functional, and and uh, and so on. It's a real, real mess. And the cost of change in this footprint is really high. If you wanted to add a field uh, to a screen here, for example, you had the employee uh, uh, date of birth, and you wanted to compute uh, age, uh, you would have to change the UI logic in HTML and JavaScript. You'd have to change the business logic potentially in Java, you'd have to potentially create a field in the relational database, you'd have to ETL that field into the data warehouse, create different KPIs, and so on and so forth, uh, propagating that change across a dozen programming languages and so on. Okay, so 20 years ago, this was a mess, but even today, uh, it's still a mess. Uh, some of the technologies are, have changed, so you might be using a, a, a cloud-based transaction system uh, or you might be using a cloud-based uh, uh, BI system like Redshift or Snowflake or BigQuery. Uh, you might be using Spark for the ETL for moving data around. You might be using Anaplan as the planning server. Uh, you're still probably using Excel somewhere. And of course, your data mining tools are now more like uh, uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or some Python libraries for Spark. But, but still the same uh, uh, soul-crushing mess uh, that we had uh, 20 years ago. Okay. And, you know, complexity uh, breeds complexity. And to compensate, uh, you know, builders of AI systems have to incur heavy compute and cloud infrastructure uh, costs because every one of those databases have to have their own servers and 
every process that's moves data moves data around has to be the same, you know, and so on. And uh, and so your your cloud fees are very high if you're building AI into your footprint, and your human labor is very high because uh, AI systems and machine learning systems require you know manual feature engineering and all this effort uh, 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 that cannot uh, is very hard to kind of make uh, systematic, and so you end up. Uh, uh, with spending a lot of money on, uh, on the cloud, uh, cloud infrastructure, you also end up spending, uh, having to hire a lot of people to handhold all this stuff. And the implications of that uh, as a, for you as a business is that you make less money because you're spending more money with Amazon and on uh, uh, hiring. You, you grow more slowly, you have scaling challenges uh, because again, you need lots of people to add capability and you know, adding people takes time and you can't move as quickly. And then you have weaker defensive modes. You can't build models that, uh, as many models to automate uh, things as, as, uh, uh, as you would want. And this was covered really, really well by a blog written by Martin Casado of Andreessen Horowitz called The New Business of AI. I would encourage you to Google it, where you know, Andreessen Horowitz was one of the most uh, successful uh, venture firms here in Silicon Valley, which is where I am, uh, is, is looking at their portfolio of, of software companies or, or portfolio of, of companies and they're looking at the AI companies and they're looking at them, they're going, man, these companies don't make as much money as non-AI companies. They don't grow as fast and they're not, uh, they don't have uh, a good defensive uh, moats. Why is that? And if you dig into his explanation, you'll know, basically it maps back down, maps, maps back to uh, they spend more money on cloud and they need more people because everything's fragile. And of course, if you are spending all this money uh, that undermines the economic argument for AI uh, in the first place, which is based on a dramatic uh, improvement in the reduction uh, in cost per, uh, per prediction or per decision, and a dramatic improvement uh, in the quality of the prediction and, and the decision. Okay, and that's covered really well in a book called Prediction Machines. Uh, if you go to predictionmachines.ai, there are some videos out there, and they kind of explain the, the economic argument for AI that's based on uh, effectively making certain predictions very, very cheap. Well, with this mess on your hand, there are many decisions, uh, many things that you can predict that you're no longer able to predict very cheaply because of this complexity. Okay, so in the few minutes I have left, um, you know, uh, I would love uh, 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 to see the world uh, move away from this application-centric architecture where you have, you know, a set of applications, each has a hairball of technologies and programming languages underneath it that you know has speaks its own language with its own ontology and schema and class diagrams that gets dumped into a data lake so and try to be you know people try to make it coherent uh, at this layer i would like to see a, a move away from that uh, uh, to one where uh, we create this layer here oops uh, that uh, re harmonizes uh, uh, the concepts that matter to a business, you know, important concepts like product or customer or vendor or uh, store, and, and looks across this mess of database technologies and programming languages and creates some coherence out of it. So um, one of uh, the companies that I'm aware of that's dealing with this is a company uh, you all know, JP Morgan. They're very public about this, uh, but uh, if, you, if you look hard enough online, you'll find them talk about how they have across JP Morgan, 17,000 SQL databases, okay? And hundreds of millions of, of, uh, uh, of uh, columns of data uh, here. I'm not exaggerating, like something on the order of 400 million columns of data. And, you know, very hard to get a handle on, uh, on all of that. And, and really at the core of their business, they have something like 400 unique concepts that are mapped to 17,000 databases and 400 million columns, okay? And the relationships be between those concepts. So you have to sort of, we have to work hard to kind of create some coherence here uh, via some kind of uh, knowledge graph or something that represents this knowledge uh, uh, away from the details of the technology that comes from and slowly refactor uh, these applications down here into something, uh, into capabilities that are delivered there, okay? so. I wish my wish list for people in software engineering is to kind of move towards a data centric architecture that, 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 that starts to get rid of all that accidental complexity uh, in the footprint. Uh, my wish list for the database community, if, if any of you are taking database classes and, and working on database research, is to get away from this madness of creating a database for 
every kind of use case. Like if you want a transaction processing or bookkeeping, you have one kind of database. If you want to support a graph payload, you have a different kind of database. If your data is in documents, you have a third kind of database. If you have, uh, uh, you know, if your data you know, needs to be managed key, you know, as a key value pairs, then you have another kind of database. Uh, this is a pretty old slide now from 2015, but even at the time, you had uh, several hundred different database technologies and data management technologies that were specialized for very specific use cases. Uh, today, um, uh, Andy Pablo, who is a professor at CMU, uh, you might have taken classes with him, maintains a database of databases. And the last time I looked at it, there was something like 780 entries in that, 780 different database technologies uh, that people have built to solve some kind of problem, right? And so I wish uh, the database community, you know, uh, steps back from the madness here, from the abyss, and comes, starts to develop database technologies that can walk and chew gum uh, so that we can support different types of payloads without having to, to have this level of specialization. Uh, and my wish list for the programming languages community uh, is to, to realize that there are a lot of uh, citizen programmers out there, uh, way more than the application developers that use C Sharp or F Sharp or C++ or Java or whatever, uh, 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 and, you know, create truly scalable end user tools, scalable beyond spreadsheeting, okay, uh, that power users and consultants and, and, and data scientists and quants uh, can use uh, and can build, so to build models declaratively in a, in a live way, in a reactive way uh, based on the, or on the spreadsheeting experience where I can interact with my model by feeding it data and immediately seeing feedback about how, what, how my model works and being able to incrementally maintain my model and again, not have to go through a long comp compilation and linking and, and, you know, and execution cycles. Uh, there's uh, definitely room out there for programming language researchers to do something compelling here that empowers uh, this community. Uh, and uh, finally, my, my final wish list for uh, uh, the machine learners uh, in the audience is to start to developing machine learning, machine learning technology like this, uh, this slide that I pulled off the internet here uh, from uh, Thomas uh, Kiff's website that understands data that's structured, structured relationally, okay, which is how all enterprise data is structured, as opposed to what we do today, which is we, we start off with data with all this sort of embedded knowledge about um, the domain. But because TensorFlow needs a data frame as input, a design matrix or feature matrix as input, that's maybe a billion rows and a thousand columns, we have to take all that uh, work that we did, that we worked hard to put in, 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 in our database ontologies and so on, and we work really hard to throw it away by joining it all together to flatten it out, to create the data frame, to feed uh, our machine learning tools. I would like to see machine learning technology evolve so I can just give you the relations uh, and give you the relationships that are already modeled, that already reflect uh, my knowledge of the business, and then uh, uh, and do for that kind of data what deep learning did for uh, uh, you know uh, pictures and videos and text and speech, uh, which is automatically or automate the process of low-level uh, feature engineering and uh, representation learning. Uh, in the enterprise today, you have you don't have such a thing, and you end up having to pay a lot of data scientists to by hand craft features that will help you uh, uh, predict the thing that you're trying to predict. Uh, and this is where we were with computer vision uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where we had to handcraft the features uh, to develop computer vision systems like the ones at Brickstream. And today, you don't have to do that anymore. You just give the machine learning system a picture, and it takes it from there. Okay. So I think there's a lot of cool work that, that I hope will be happening in the, uh, in the machine learning community uh, to automate that. And uh, if we do that, I believe that uh, in the future, enterprise systems will be uh, uh, built using a reactive data-centric architecture using knowledge graphs as a foundation. I'm sorry, I forgot to, to close the parentheses here. And that, uh, you know, whereas today, a, a sophisticated system is built up of many components, each of which is handcrafted, over time, more and more of these components will either be learned. The poster child for this is uh, Google Translate. It used to be a few million lines of C++ code written by hand. Now it's a 500 line Python script that sets up TensorFlow to learn uh, the mapping from you know, one language to another, right? So 
uh, uh, you know, uh, you can think of uh, machine learning as learning uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the contents of a function that in the old days you would have had to write by hand, right? That maps inputs to outputs. So uh, more and more components will be developed that way, or more and more components will be declared, kind of like we declare things in SQL and, and Excel today. Uh, but but you, we need richer uh, uh, languages uh, uh, and that can express more sophisticated uh, capability, more sophisticated requirements. And so these components will be declared and then executed via a sophisticated reasoner in sort of the good old fashioned AI sense. Okay, and hopefully uh, the days of instructing the computer step by step how to perform a task uh, will be or should be uh, uh, behind us if we can do all those things. Okay, and uh, I know it sounds like a lot, but I don't think we're, you know, decades away here. I think there are a lot of interesting trends uh, in, in the software engineering community, the PL, the PL community, the database community, and the machine learning community sort of pointed in that direction, uh, but it's also not around the corner. Uh, uh, so as you, yeah, you, you, know, you graduate and you go out in industry, I suspect you'll be seeing a lot of what I talked about uh, uh, if you end up joining enterprises that, uh, you know, um, that aren't Google, uh, that uh, need to build uh, systems uh, to enhance decision making and so on. Okay, and sorry, I, Daniel, I just now saw your hand raised. I don't know how long ago you raised it, but I'm happy to take a question now. I'm actually done with the presentation and uh, happy to uh, take questions from anybody. Uh, Daniel, you, you have something to ask? Yeah, so, so this kind of last section about recommendations or vision for the future, um, it seems to me that, that a lot of these really focus more on uh, people problems than necessarily technology problems. For example, your example of JP Morgan um, having so many tables uh, and rows and columns and, and all that, it, it seems like that, that kind of stems from organizational inefficiency. I forget what the research was, but it's like any organization of more than like 200 or 500 employees starts incurring significant inefficiency costs. Um, and at least from my industry experience, you know, I was at a 50,000 person company and I knew of at least two other groups that were doing the same project that I was doing. Yeah. Um, with like a slightly different flavor. So I was just curious, um, like how, um, if, if you have any thoughts on like how you make progress in these areas, given that like you're still going to have huge companies with these inefficiencies. Yeah, so I, it's a fair point. And, and some of these problems are obviously social. Uh, they're not entirely technical, but you know, what I see, and I, yeah, I'm sure you saw it if you work in organizations at large, right? Uh, what I see is a lot of people rolling their own analysis and analytics in Excel, okay? Mm -hmm. they, 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 uh, this guy here who shared this, uh, this uh, diagram with me told me an anecdote at this company uh, where they wanted to add, I think, one digit to employee numbers. Let's say they had a four digit employee number. They wanted to make it five, uh, five digits. And it took them over a year and a few million dollars just to just to make that change, okay? So uh, I think there's a part of this that's social, but I think a big part of it is also the accidental complexity that you have to incur today in implementing even the most simple model, okay? Uh, the most basic application, uh, if, if you wanna make a data-driven application, if you wanna make the, uh, an application that uses some predictive modeling uh, to enhance decision-making, still in many cases has to get mapped to maybe not the entirety of the stack, uh, but a lot of it. And in companies like mine, like Retech and HNC and, and Optimi and so on, our, our company was a software company and those companies were, you know, for most of their lives were a couple hundred people. And we had to also deal with this complexity and we were not able to serve the needs of our customers or, or expand our markets uh, 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 very quickly because any time we wanted to add a feature, we had this mess looking us in the face, okay? And so I believe if we start uh, attacking this problem from a software engineering perspective, which is about architecture and a PL perspective, which is about you know, moving in the direction of declarativity and a uh, machine learning perspective, which is around automating feature engineering and a database perspective, which means I don't need to have 17 copies of the data, okay? I think you start removing the accidental complexity and you can start actually, um, uh, you know, working against a footprint that looks like this, um, sorry, uh, like this, 
where you have a few dozen concepts or maybe a, a low number of like two or three or 400 concepts that uh, you standardize in your enterprise and people, instead of developing things one app at a time, start to extend uh, this knowledge graph uh, in ways that support whatever business uh, requirements they have because you don't need to kind of, you know, uh, uh, bring, you know, an army of people to add a particular uh, a bit of capability. Okay. Now, even in that world, I do have to acknowledge that there will be uh, politics and uh, competing budgets and priorities, and you might end up with a redundancy, but you can, uh, I think uh, you believe me when I tell you that you can factor out that redundancy way more easily if you built it on a simpler stack with fewer moving parts and very little uh, accidental complexity. Okay, yeah, thank you, that, that was helpful. Okay, so it's not about um, outrunning uh, the bear necessarily in all cases. You just have to outrun whatever people do today. You have to improve what people do today and what people do today is really soul crushing and horrific. Okay, uh, so if we, uh, we look at this by, you know, let's take a positive step forward. Uh, it's still, uh, I think, saving a lot of human potential that's now wasted managing this mess. Maybe briefly along those lines, um, I think you alluded to this, but in a typical project that you would do, what do you, how would you estimate how much work is in the modeling and how much work is kind of just in getting the data there and getting it in the right shape and so on? So I didn't get into this, um, but when we, um, we, when we got to the point where we were doing uh, logic flux, okay, like at this part of my journey, which is, uh, you know, now in the 2010 to 2016 timeline, okay, we started building more and more of these types of components that we weren't able to get. And we found that, uh, you know, the, the difference for us is that people building software in this more model-based way, okay, using, um, you know, better programming paradigms and better data management paradigms, we can get a group of, let's say, five people uh, to build the same sophisticated applications that at Retac we were building with 50 people. And they could do it in six months, uh, whereas, uh, you know, 50 people would take a couple of years to do it in the Retac context, okay? So it's completely anecdotal. I don't, you know, I can't hand on heart tell you that it's an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude faster and cheaper, uh, but, uh, but anecdotal, you know, like for sure in all cases, but anecdotally for the types of applications that we built in retail, because I got to do it twice. I got to do it at Retech uh, on, this, on this mess uh, here, okay? And then I got to do it uh, at Logic Blocks on a much more simplified footprint, and it was much, 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 much um, faster and cheaper. E easily in order of magnitude, maybe two. Mm -hmm. Jake? Yeah, so um, on your comment about you know, trying to impute uh, relations between data do you have any opinions about um, the utility of causal learning for that? Causal learning is uh, uh, becoming very popular. Uh, it's just you know um, a new capability that you know from a mathematical and computational perspective is starting to become within reach. Uh, you know before you do have pearls uh, sort of popularizing this area, people would do you know we do a lot of A/B testing you know in, in contexts where we're, we're talking about causal learning now. Uh, so it's just one of many different kinds of machine learning technologies that you want to be able to support in your footprint. So some business applications would, could uh, uh, benefit tremendously from understanding why uh, something happened. And uh, today, if you wanted to do that, you would be basically adding to this mess. You would have, I don't know what your favorite causal learning tool is. Uh, so, you know, at, uh, at the relational AI, uh, one of my colleagues um, wrote a probabilistic programming language called Sauce and a programming language called Julia. And it has causal inference capability. And so you would have to figure out how to put that in this mess here. But you might have TensorFlow and you might have some Python libraries and you would have uh, that light, you know, that system and they would have to coexist and you'd have to stitch together uh, a capability that includes causal learning and causal inference, but also includes other kinds of machine learning. So uh, I, think, uh, I think actually knowledge graphs is a foundation for causal learning. Um, um, are great because it makes certain things easier to do if you have relational information uh, uh, so that you wouldn't have in a flat, in a, in, a, in a grounded or a data frame. Like for example, the knowledge graph would know that I have a twin brother 
which I don't, let's say I did. And therefore, if you're trying to do an analysis like they did in the 50s and 60s around smoking and the smoking cause cancer, well, the, the tobacco companies argued against that by saying, well, we don't know if smoking causes cancer. It could be that there are people who have a gene that causes both cancer and smoking. And uh, there's no way that you can, you know, you shouldn't confuse correlation with causation. Uh, and so uh, the way you get around that is you find people who are twins, and one of them smokes and one of them doesn't, and that, you know, identical twins. And so they have the same genetic makeup and you say, no, uh, that, that cannot be. And so that information is relational information. It's about relationships that would exist in a knowledge graph that would not exist in a, in a flat uh, uh, data frame, for example, that you would, you would have to model uh, by hand. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but I think it's an exciting area. I don't have a ton of first-hand experience with it. That was illuminating, thank you. Any other questions? Ask Jones. Maybe to close, can you um, pitch a little bit what you're doing these days? Yeah, so uh, I'm building a knowledge graph management system because I believe uh, I've seen this problem. I believe that this is a real problem. I believe uh, that these layers have gone out of control. Uh, I, I see now that we've moved uh, technology forward enough where we can build a very scalable knowledge graph management system that leverages knowledge, clean knowledge up here to both accelerate and enhance statistical machine learning uh, of all flavors, you know, generative flavors and discriminative flavors and so on, uh, but also uh, that has an underlying reasoning capability where for most of your business logic, I don't need to write Java code and C-sharp code. I can just express that declaratively. Uh, uh, and uh, we are working with customers now that are seeing, again, amazing improvements moving off code bases. You know, there's one example I'm thinking of, 800,000 lines of C-sharp, uh, less than 10,000 lines of, uh, of declarative knowledge, okay? Uh, and a solution that's more scalable and so on. So. It's really, for me, it's all about uh, building a knowledge graph uh, management system that's open, that's scalable, uh, that's uh, uh, reactive, uh, that supports a data-centric architecture that uh, ultimately lets us uh, learn and reason using knowledge and data to do things that you can't do today or you can't, do, you can't afford to do today, given the, uh, the, the alternative. So if you're interested in that kind of problem, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I, I really meant, uh, what I, everything I said today, and I really think these are real problems, and I wouldn't be wasting my time uh, building uh, uh, what we're building uh, or helping build what we're building uh, if I didn't think this was a real problem and that the world needed it solved. So. All right. All right. Thank you so much. All right. I'll drop. I'll let you continue your class. Thanks, Bye. Christian.